Jeff Schaefer is the uh, executive or a executive producer on Curb Your Enthusiasm, which has been running for 10 seasons, and Dave, which has been running for one season. He also uh, created Dave and serves as a writer and director on Curb. Uh, I'm at Noble Gold Derby here to ask you, Jeff, what's the biggest difference between the two shows? Um, the biggest difference between the two shows are the two leads. Um, and although there are also, I will say, incredible similarities. Uh, Dave and Larry are both playing versions of themselves. Um, you know, on Curb, Larry, uh, TV Larry is like the wish fulfillment version of real Larry. And on Dave, it's sort of the opposite. Dave is playing himself almost so real and he's telling the most honest and open things. You're like, I can't believe you're saying this on camera and you're not even doing it behind a character. Like, you're just, you're just being yourself. It's very brave. Hmm. You've, you've, worked, you've worked so long on Curb, you've worked so long with uh, Larry and you're on Seinfeld and, and, and working on that there too. What's, what's the biggest lesson you've taken from Curb when you were sort of starting up the show, Dave? Structure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that comes from Seinfeld. I mean, Larry taught uh, me and Alec Berg and Dave Mandel, he taught us all, uh, Larry and Jerry taught us how to write a certain way. And it was coming up with really good stories and then weaving them together to form like some sort of comedy geometry that had a fulfilling ending. And that curb is written the exact same way. We just don't spend the time to write all the dialogue. And I think for Dave, especially because Dave had never done a TV show before and he had a lot of ideas, but it was like, these ideas won't mean anything unless they're structured well. Um, not only for the episode, but for the season too. So that was, I think, one of the biggest helps I could give to Dave just because he was so green in that field. Yeah. Oh, it's interesting. Can you think of a particular episode in Dave this, uh, this, uh, for the first season that, uh, was the structure was important and, um, or, yeah, or the, I mean, that worked really well. I'll tell you the initial version of the pilot was actually when we pitched it, it was the most important day of Dave Bird's life. It was the day that he hit send on his first viral video, put it out into the internet and was immediately, you know, it became a viral sensation and he, he says it was the day that he knew he, he became who he knew he could be. So no bigger moment in a guy's life, right? Than becoming mm -hmm. Little Dicky. And that was the original pilot uh, concept. And when we talked to FX, they were, they were saying like, boy, origin stories just seem so boring because we already know what the ending is. And it makes everyone else who doesn't believe in them feel like too much of a stick in the mud. And I sort of thought about it and I was like, oh my gosh, they're right. Let's, let's dump this. Let's drop us in three weeks after that viral video, four weeks after that viral video, when he's nothing. He's just a guy who had a viral video three Wednesdays ago. And, but he's still got all this confidence and he still wants to be legitimate. And it just dropping you in that way made for a much more interesting pilot. Um, and I think started us off in a much more interesting way. Oh, that's cool. Um, do, you have, do you have a favorite moment from Dave from the first season? Well, there are moments that I feel are just, uh, remarkably well written and acted. I think Allie's, um, Allie's speech at the wedding where she's basically congratulating her sister and breaking up with Dave at the same time uh, is an amazing moment. And Taylor did a fantastic job and Vanessa McGee uh, who wrote it did an incredible job. Um, then there are moments where some of my favorite moments though are when Dave who's so accomplished in so many ways um, showed how little he knew about TV production. So there's a, a moment in its show uh, six where Dave is bringing his whole gang back to Philadelphia to meet his parents. Mm -hmm. And his mom is cooking something called company chicken. And Dave's real mom, when he brought friends over, cooked company chicken, this chicken dish. And it was Dave's favorite dish. And we got the right recipe. We cooked real company chicken. And Dave was so excited. And we're at lunch. So we're about to shoot a dinner scene that goes for six hours after lunch. And he's eating and he's talking about how he can't wait for company chicken. And I'm like, Dave, you got to slow down with the company chicken. Like, you're going to be eating this for a long time. He goes, yeah, 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 that's fine. I get it. So we get into the scene and we're in the wides and he's just mowing company chicken. And then he's eating company chicken in between takes. I'm like, <laughs> then we finally get to his close up. Where we're supposed to see, we're supposed to see how much he loves company chicken. And you've never seen an unhappier, sadder man. I'm like, Dave, you got to eat the chicken. And he just goes, oh, oh. <laughs> It's like, you won't, and I'm like, you won't make this mistake again. 
So it's been a learning curve. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Uh, what, 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 um, what, is it, is there, do, like, is there a difference in the energy of a show in its first season compared to a show in its 10th season? It's sort of interesting. You sort of were in both of those worlds the past year. The, the energy, I was trying to make sure the energy around set is loose and the actors are having fun. So everyone, because we want to, we want people to improvise. We want people to be loose and just whatever the best joke is works. So I always try to create the same kind of atmosphere where anything can happen. That being said, when you're in your 10th season and, you know, and we are, the curb is the college kid who took eight years to graduate. I mean, it's 10, <laughs> it's 10 seasons, but it's 20 years. So, mm. so everybody knows each other pretty well. Um, so people just slide right into their roles. I mean, you don't have to tell Susie Essman what her motivation is. Mm. Um, but when it's a first season and everyone's trying to feel out their characters, um, there's a lot more talk about that stuff because you don't want to make a choice that sends you down the wrong path. And now you're stuck with this for episodes after episodes. Yeah. Uh, t- talking about Curb and the 10th season of the show, um, what, what was different or special about that 10th season for you? Well, every season is the final season. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the last episode of a season is always the last episode of Curb that will ever exist. I mean, the end of season five was called The End. And Larry yeah. meant it. <laughs> yeah. so, and I finally realized why. Um, because at the end of the season, he's put all the good ideas he has into that season. So he doesn't have any more ideas that he's really excited about. So how could he ever do another season? Because he doesn't have any more ideas. And I finally realized Larry is the only person on earth who thinks he's not going to come up with more good ideas. So, um, you know, every time it kicks around again, Larry will call and he'll say like, I'm not doing another season. And I go, I know. Because if I did, I only have one idea. And then you want to talk about it? It's like, ah, it's a waste of time. Oh, we can talk about it. And it goes on like this for a while until we have about seven episodes written. And then I say, we should call HBO and tell them we're going to do another season because we got to crew up. Um, so this, this interesting thing about season 10 was this was the first time that didn't happen. When we were done with season nine, we were sitting in the editing room and we were finishing up the last edit of the final episode of season nine. And you know, we're always talking about ideas. And Larry just said, well, I'll see you in the office on Monday. And I'm like, oh, all right. <laughs> okay. Let's, I guess we're going again. Great. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it was, I think he had so much fun season nine. He just, he wanted to do it right away again for season 10. And, uh, and we had a blast. Has Larry changed over the years in any ways? Do you think? No, Larry's, Larry's the constant. Yeah. The world changed, right? The world changes, but Larry is Larry. And that's, and so he just, he stays the same and has his Larry opinions and his Larry reactions to things. Um, so I think, for instance, for this season, for, we wanted to reflect a little bit of the world that we were all living in, right? Between the MAGA hats and the Me Too movement. And, but of course we do it in our own Larry way with, you know, how do you, you don't want to give your assistant the Heimlich because you're afraid of where to touch. So, in the, you know, we want to do it in our own sort of curb way. And I was so worried because we'd written the season and shot it and we were holding on, we were done in the fall and we were holding on till air till January because our first episode had a happy new year's thing. And I was so worried that someone else was going to do like a big me too storyline. And then I sort of realized what other sitcom is going to have their lead actor get get you know get me too i was like oh, i think we're okay um but uh i don't know this i guess this year we did we did want to reflect the the world we're living in more yeah i think uh yeah I, but, but probably my favorite bit on that whole storyline was the following around um um a, a caterer or a, a waitress because you want a particular hors d'oeuvre and how from one person's perspective, that can be quite a creepy thing, and the other person's perspective, completely innocent. No, they're the yeah. best, the best appetizer. And you know the origin of that too. There was there was a joke that I wrote on Seinfeld in 1994. As for one of our first ones, it was there. Were, George was at a some sort of like dinner party, and he asked the caterer, "Where do you come out of?" Because <laughs> he wanted to he wanted to get closer to the source so he could get the good stuff. And it's always sort of struck me as a funny thing. So. This story was sort of the, is the evolution of that um, for, for Larry. 
Oh, I love that. Uh, do you have a favourite moment from the season of uh, Kerr, from season 10? You know, a few things are interesting. One is that by the time when the season started, the world was very different from when the season ended. Like the coronavirus stuff hit around episode seven. So um, for the viewer, it was a totally different experience now. And, you know, we work so hard to get to the season finale where all of these little things we had set up uh, caused Larry's um, store to catch on fire mm -hmm. and to stay on fire. And it was this intricate thing and it worked out and we thought it was all so good. And then people watched the show and all they could think of was, oh my God, you burned all that Purell. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, yes. Um, but favorite moments, um, I mean, Larry with the MAGA hat, was fantastic and i cannot believe that we were able to keep it a secret i mean we were standing out on san vicente boulevard shooting the, the him with a biker we had lots of extras and larry would just tell the extras please don't tell anybody like i want this to be a secret um and they all they all kept their word um so i thought that was those were some really funny those were some really funny scenes but i will say my favorite actually i think my favorite was probably larry and nick kroll uh, Nick Kroll, who's the maitre d' of the restaurant where there's a, a pretty section and an ugly section. <laughs> and watching the two of them spar was amazing. What, what, um, what about the, the so Kurt's obviously done very well at the Emmys in terms of nominations over the years. You've been nominated uh, in the best comedy series category. Um, uh, I know for every season you, you've been producing on the show, it's, uh, it always gets in there. I think the only season of Curb that didn't get nominated for Best Comedy Series was the first season uh, mm. of, of the show. Um, in a changing television landscape, how have you sort of maintained a, a consistency with that show? I mean, the short answer is three words. Larry motherfucking David. <laughs> I think the, the, the longer answer is we're still doing exactly what Larry wants to do, which is talking about really funny stories that you can relate to. Like, look, in this climate, everyone's worried about the big things. And lots of people should be worried about big things. There's lots of big things to worry about. But someone has to worry about the little things. Someone has to, someone has to you know, document the petty injustices that we deal with every day. And I think that's still the beauty of Curb is that people look at it one of two ways. Oh my God, that happened to me. I'm so glad he's yelling at that person. Or, yeah, I've done that. I, I, I do it again too. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's uniquely relatable, I think, because at heart, we're all, we've all got a little Larry inside us. Yeah. What's your, um, what, what's, what's, um, you wrote quite a few, you, you directed and wrote episodes this season. What was the biggest challenge for you in sort of uh, any of the episodes you wrote or directed? Well, I think what people don't really understand. And by right, by right, sorry, came up with the story for, you didn't lie. Oh, right. Well, yeah, because we have, it's not written by, I guess it's story by, because we have, we have outlines, not scripts. And I think yeah. one of the challenges, I think what people don't really realize is it's, it's not just improvised. We don't just show up at an intersection and go, hey, we should have a car accident. Where, you know, so um, the structure is, is all the writing and that's the part where Larry and I go, oh, this is hard. But the fun part is then being on set with amazingly talented people who are improvising. And what people don't, I think, realize is that every scene is a live rewrite. And so as a director too, I'm writing and directing at the same time. You're writing just someone's saying something, you're whispering in people's ears. Larry wants to be surprised. So I'm just whispering in people's ears things to say because he wants to hear it fresh for the first time. Our rehearsals are literally walk over here, blah, blah, blah. No words are said because he wants it to be fresh. So you're doing this sort of thing where everyone, you're telling everyone around Larry what to do. And it's actually a lot like Larry's worldview. It's everyone against Larry. And so I get to play everyone else. And um, I think that's the real challenge. And whether it's for directing, for writing, for editing, like it's all like that writing and directing is happening live. It's like covering a live comedy sporting event. It's very different. And you have to be thinking like an editor uh, as you're directing, writing like a writer as you're directing, um, and also writing like a director. Meaning like, if I know JB is gonna say something really funny, I better get out of Larry's over because Larry's gonna laugh and it's gonna ruin the shot. So anyway, it's a, it's, 
exhausting um, and you need super talented actors to do it, but I love it. Yeah. What, what's the, like with, with the show, I'd imagine maybe more so than other shows, are there scenes that like end up being much longer than you thought when you were planning them? Or Yeah, you don't, I mean, you have ideas for some lines that there's a few lines in the outline and then there's lines that you sort of, oh, I want to try this, I want to try that. But then, you know, a scene with Larry and, and JB Smoove, it's going to take a turn. And so you have a plan and then you're prepared to throw that plan out the window because now we're, now we're talking about something completely different. And, and sometimes the trick is, and again, this is th a writer thinking like a director and a director thinking like an editor, is you have to know, oh my God, this thing was so funny. Do we even have a setup to get to this? You know, do we, we have to go back and like, sometimes you have to go back and, and cover things that are super funny, but you've got to cover them in the right way. Sometimes you've got to cover the setup so you can even get to it in the editing room. Um, so you're always, you're always thinking about, you're literally always thinking about the edit room and generating as many options as possible. So yeah, the scenes are longer, and then in the edit room, they get tighter and smaller again. Has there been a great moment that you've, you've loved uh, that wasn't able to make it into one of the episodes? Oh, there's so many. Yeah. <laughs> so many. And I, you know, this is a constant struggle I have with Larry. I'm like, we should put out, you know, deleted scenes and, and other stray bits. And Larry just firmly believes, he goes, if it's, if it's not in the episode, why would anyone want to see it? And I'm like, Larry, the whole reason they want to see it is because it's not in the episode. But he just wants, he's like, this is what we decided on. So this is what everyone's going to see. But for every choice that we make that goes in, on a lot of places, there's, there's a, a 1A that was just as funny, but we, you know, we had to make a choice. Only one of those moments could go in. I mean, and sometimes for time, too. I mean, there was a great moment, right just off the top of my head, in, in, uh, on season nine with Salman Rushdie, who was talking about the benefits of the fatwa and yeah. all the good parts about it. He was, he was, they were walking out, and Salman was talking about his butler, and Larry was sort of asking about, could I, you know, how do I get a butler? And, and Salman just said, you know, maybe I'd, and Larry said, maybe I'd get a female butler. And someone just stops Larry and says, rule number one about butlers, never fuck your butler. And <laughs> it was just like having someone rush you talk about never fucking your butler <laughs> was so funny. It just, we didn't have the time for it. It didn't fit. But um, yeah, that's a, that's a long-winded way of saying it. almost every scene has stuff I wish uh, people could see because there's just so much magic we can't fit in. Yeah, I, I, I guess from Larry's perspective, it's like, you know, it's not like uh, when you go to the art gallery, they've got the Picasso drafts, like, or whatever. It's like, it's right. the finished works. You're being kind, but yes, that's, that's basically, yeah. he just, uh, he just, he's like, we made our decision. We think, I think it's the right decision. And, and he always wants, uh, that's why he doesn't, he would like the show to come out like, you know, sometimes you wake up, you're fine that night, you wake up the next morning, you have a pimple. He wants the show to just show up like a pimple <laughs> on America's face. Like he doesn't want anybody to know anything about it. He's so, um, he's so uh, desirous of having people be surprised by the twists and turns. Yeah. Um, and, and Kirby is a show where you do want that because often the way all the threads come together at the end are um, sort of surprising, but um, wonderful. Uh, final question, uh, Jeff. Um, if Larry David and Dave from Dave met each other, how do you think that encounter would, would play out? Well, interestingly, I have a lot of experience with this because we basically wrote the Dave pilot in my curb office. <laughs> so Dave and I would be talking about stuff and uh, earlier in the morning and then Larry would show up and poke his head in and he would go, what are you guys doing? It's like, oh, I'm just working with Dave here. And he's like, okay, I'll be in a sec. And so they have talked and they've met. And the funny thing is Dave Bird, you know, I always call Larry LD, everyone calls Larry LD. Yeah. And Dave Bird, little Dicky goes, oh, you know, everybody calls me LD. And I just go, no, 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 no. <laughs> you are not LD. There's only one LD, he's in the other room. You, you're just Dave. <laughs> did, La did Larry like that you were working on another show or was he a bit like, he, you know, he was like, I was like, oh, I'm just, I didn't, I wasn't really expecting these shows sort of, I wasn't expecting to do another show. I just, as I started talking to Dave, it, it became sort of obvious this was a show. Um, and the way the, the way the 
production schedules worked out, it was totally cool. Mm -hmm. um, I was sort of, I was in post for Curb when we were writing Dave. So I was sort of, and I put the writer's room across Olympics. So I was basically running across four lanes of traffic every day um, for a summer. But uh, no, I think the, uh, uh, Larry, by the way, has, has seen and really enjoyed Dave, which was nice and meant a lot, meant a lot to Dave for sure. Yeah, oh, that's good. Well, Jeff, thanks so much for talking to us. All the best of luck with the Emmy Awards for both of them. It'd, lovely to see, it'd be lovely to see Dave get some nominations. Uh, it'd be lovely to see Curb get some wins. Um, and, uh, yeah, all the best of luck at the Emmy Awards. Uh, for people watching this interview, you can go to goldderby.com and make your own Emmy predictions and watch other interviews with award contenders. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thank you. Very fun. 